So in this session we're going to follow on from uh, looking at the factors that control contaminants in soils to have a look at some of the effects of urbanisation and urban land contamination on uh, the biological parts of the system including us. So to do that we'll have a look through a, a few case studies basically, um, looking at the effects of urban soil contamination on different things uh, in the context of toxicity, biodiversity and also transfer through food webs. And then the, there's some uh, way that we can exploit the adverse effects of soil contamination for instance on organisms by using some organisms for bioindicators or bioassays to actually give a measure of the severity of contamination themselves. To do that um, we're going to try and look for these things in the examples. So that with the overall idea that urbanisation has effects on the health of organisms including us as humans uh, and effects on ecosystems in terms of biodiversity and the, the uh, ecological balance if you like favouring one part of a trophic web over another. Um, the effects are actually quite complex and so we're going to look at for all these different issues in the examples that we have different responses for different species the fact that we have co-contamination different contaminants occur together and there are a couple of examples where we show that um, different contaminants themselves affecting different soil functions or processes uh, and maybe perhaps different species um, each contaminant whether it's a metal or organic or whatever can have different bioavailability um, and that depends on both the soil properties and the characteristics of the organism in question. Um, the transfers of contaminants via food webs, and in particular we're concerned about transfer to the human food chain but the, there's also other transfers that can occur that give unexpected effects not necessarily directly related to the soil contamination. Uh, and um, the one last idea that's important, there are multiple risk pathways um, both from soil and from urbanisation itself. Okay. So with the first example, something that we've seen before, this, uh, these data from Hansen et al. show a correlation between urbanisation and species or plant species diversity um, with uh, the proxy being forest uh, proportion. So zero forest, lots of development, 100% uh, forest or proportion of one, uh, less development and there are subtle but significant effects on the diversity of uh, herb or forb species and trees. Uh, they didn't find so much for shrubs um, and I guess one of the more important issues uh, is the effects on the number of animal species. Uh, so we get an increase in the number of exotic or introduced species, a total decrease in the number of species which is more subtle but a, a quite a profound decrease in the number of native species as we move from exurban mean outside an urban area through suburban to an urban area. Now th those are the sort of things that people get upset about. It's harder to see loss of plant biodiversity but if we see our favourite animals disappear then we get upset about it. Um, and the other types of things is that um, we see are, are changes in ecological balance. So just to review this, um, some of the first things that we see happening are removal of the, the top of the food chain, the top carnivores disappear, um, uh, and predator sensitive natives as introduced predators uh, come in often, uh, foxes, cats and so on are in our part of the world. Um, and then natives which are sensitive to changes in habitat. Of course some native species uh, are, do well in urban systems and some don't. Uh, but we always, almost always see an increase in weedy plants or uh, undesirable exotics basically. And so with um, urban development, so this is with our forest proxy here increasing in this direction, we find that we have a, a sweet spot where we've got two types of environment present uh, in the middle where there are more species but uh, with large amounts of urbanisation there is lower biodiversity um, even compared with the, com 
completely unchanged landscape. Uh, and if we look at the number of species against age of development, um, then we see quite a significant decrease in terms of age of development as these types of ecological changes gradually occur. So moving to a different sort of scale, and th those examples previously are from more large scale, if we go to a what's happening in the soil and what's happening to in individual plants perhaps. Well the main, the main issue for individual plants is toxicity but of course some of those ecological changes are happening because different species are less or more sensitive to soil contamination than others. Um, so this was an interesting experiment uh, partly because there were a mix of contaminants present in some of the treatments which is more realistic that's most commonly the situation in urban contaminated or any contaminated environments that we have multiple contaminants uh, and they worked differently in combination than they did individually uh, and there are differences in uh, different plant species in terms of their response to contaminants right so while um, cucumber and cress seem to be very very sensitive to the mix, uh, the the mix of contaminants being much much lower than control. The same was not true for a different type of species, sorghum. Um, I don't know whether that has anything to do with it being a C4 plant compared with C3 in uh, the crest and cucumber, but you never know. Um, but that, I guess uh, that's the species dependence here, which is one of the things we're going to look out for. And the other thing is that uh, different contaminants have a different effect. So while there was a minimal effect on yield in most cases with on the vertical axis percent growth index versus the control or untreated, um, so no effect is sitting at 100% um, for different contaminants. There are different effects. Uh, chromium-6 for cucumber, not very toxic at all. Um, not too many individual contaminants except arsenic for example toxic to cress in all cases arsenic uh, involved a significant reduction in growth of the uh, the plants um, and the other effect being that the the mix versus the predicted effect of the mix um, based on the additive effect of all the uh, so we basically add up all the decreases from 100 percent and bring that bar down. Um, quite different, so the mix of contaminants, we're not seeing a cumulative effect quite. Um, it's related but not exactly the same. So th those are some of the effects that we, we wanted to look for. Species specificness, contaminant specificity, uh, and also the, the lack of um, additive effects when there are mixed contaminants present. Alright, um, toxicity to different types of organisms, so that previous example for plants, this one for microorganisms, not necessarily measuring microbial numbers directly, so we've got a few proxies of microbial activity, um, production of dehydrogenase enzyme or production of urease enzyme, or um, more functional assessments, nitrification activity or actually microbial biomass, um, which is usually determined by a respiration type measurement. Okay, but um, relative to controls, which are the bars on the left hand side, we see effects of, of all on all of these proxies for microbial activity, dehydrogenase, urease, nitrification and microbial biomass. Less of a profound effect on dehydrogenase, which is produced by a lot of microbial species compared with the others. Um, and probably the most profound effects on nitrification, which is as we all probably know, a microbial process which is conducted in soils by relatively few taxa compared to some of the other things. Uh, but there is was a quite a significant increase, decrease in um, microbial biomass carbon as well. So, um, uh, how did they make sense of all this? There were multiple contaminants at these manufactured gas plant soils. Um, and that included metals and organic contaminants like polyaromatic hydrocarbons. How did they make sense of it? Well, they, in this case, used what we call a multivariate technique. 
principal component analysis in this case, which is kind of a data reduction technique. It, it uh, reduces the multivariate information, um, so the concentrations of multiple contaminants into uh, a set of orthogonal components, um, so we can create fewer master variables, and those master variables have a contribution from all of the variables in the data set, but with uh, different weightings. Now that's a, a bit of a simplistic and not very accurate idea of principal component analysis, but you get the idea. Um, and on th this is a, a triplot of what we call, so it's uh, the positions of the symbols uh, for the predictors, that's the contaminants, should be associated with the things that they have an effect on. Uh, so nitrification, for example, seems to be predominantly affected by lead and cadmium concentrations in the soil. So the principal component analysis is quite a, a powerful technique to identify some of those effects, but different things are diff seem to be affected by different contaminate contaminants. So urease, for example, lies more in the, the sector of the triplot where the polyaromatic hydrocarbons sit of different types, high molecular weight and low molecular weight, or just the total concentration. So that highlights a few of the effects that we're interested in seeing as well. Here's another one, okay, using a, I guess, a, an idealized organism, in this case called uh, Vibrio fisheri, which is a bioluminescent organism, so you can, um, we've got a little picture of what might look like under uh, a microscope, the appropriate light filtration and so forth. Uh, so the experiment is to expose these indicator organisms to a soils with a range of PAH, or polyaromatic hydrocarbon concentrations in this instance, and measure the, the decrease in um, bioluminescence, which gives us our toxicity test. Um, so we've got a, a range of different apparent toxicities depending on whether the organisms are exposed to whole soil or an organic extract of soil or a water or aqueous extract of soil all taking out different forms or, uh, of PAHs all may be bound in, in different ways in the soil so um, in, in some ways you could expect the bioavailability to be different uh, in this case uh, for each type of extract and that uh, we can see a number of different effects. Um, more toxicity for a whole soil from this one labelled RA, which actually curiously has quite low total PAH concentrations, even compared with the next one, IA, which has very, very high PAH. It still has one of the higher toxicity or um, attenuation of the bioluminescence. Uh, it does have the highest worst case toxicity, um, which one would expect. Uh, but there's a lot of variability and it doesn't quite seem to match up um, the worst case toxicity, not the same as, as mean uh, and not necessarily ranked by their uh, PAH concentrations, although in the worst case they seem to be. And then why is the difference? Well, the difference is probably due to differences in bioavailability, which we can see by the, the differences in uh, toxicity from whole soil or organic extract or uh, aqueous extract. Okay, so bioavailability of PAHs in this case, probably quite important. Um, there's only one organism and only one type of contaminant, so everything else must be due to either the absolute concentration or the bioavailability of the contaminant. Okay, earthworms quite commonly use for uh, bioindicator organisms uh, or for looking at the effects of contamination because they're pretty much ubiquitous at least in temperate zone soils uh, where a lot of people live um, and you can look at a number of parameters related to earthworm health if you like uh, so the experiment here involved these five different soils and five patches within those soils so quite a nice experiment because it accounts for heterogeneity in soils. It's not all the same, even at one site there are differences. And the crosshatched show the presence of um, 
significant concentrations of contaminants and if they exceed environmental thresholds they've got the black shading in them uh, and sometimes the, there's negligible concentrations of some contaminants so for example this East Park Wood site at patch 5 um, we've got copper and lead there um, but negligible cadmium zinc or polyaromatic hydrocarbons contrast that with you know, some of the more contaminated patches uh, Bilston Gas Works patch 2 copper um, lead zinc and total PAH above environmental guidelines same for one of the Lady Moore sites here so a range of different contamination and then measuring the endpoint of the organism of production of juveniles so breeding success basically um, and so the higher the bar the more babies the worms are having uh, and uh, there are some significant effects some of which kind of make sense some of which don't let's focus on a couple of patches if you like so each graph refers to a different soil and this patch 5 is the LNR soil there are there's zero breeding success there and it is one of the most contaminated patches another zero breeding success patch 4 at PPW actually happens to be quite a bit less contaminated um, so there's a bit of a mismatch there um, where's the other very contaminated one uh, patch 2 at BGW um, certainly a depletion relative to the cleaner sites in breeding success of earthworms but not as severe as at the Ladymore site so uh, some things make sense some don't so much um, and ag again there are issues with bioavailability and bioaccessibility of the contaminants involved in this case polyaromatic hydrocarbons okay. so um, whether it's a soil porosity thing or polyaromatic hydrocarbons being adsorbed to organic matter and, and that detoxifying them we don't really know and in cases like this you can't be sure that the populations at the more contaminated sites may or may not have acclimatized to the contamination either so there, there are complex things at work here with toxicity um, so let's leave toxicity alone for a while talk about food web transfers so not looking at, at health suffering but in this case these data here lead in earthworms looking at the concentrations of lead in earthworm bodies at two categories of site and for three different uh, habits of earthworms so this relates to how they burrow and, and um, how often they come to the surface and all that I, I'm not that up with earthworm biology so you'd have to look these terms up but basically three different categories of earthworm two different categories of site and for every category of earthworm there's a significant statistical effect for lead concentration in earthworm bodies to be higher in the urban sites okay not surprising for a soil dwelling effectively soil eating organism that the urban sites contain higher concentrations uh, of potential contaminants right so one of the complications of this of course is that it doesn't end with the earthworms there are birds for example that are quite fond of eating earthworms the blackbird um, quite an abundant species worldwide even it's been introduced to uh, many parts of Australia New Zealand as northern hemisphere native uh, but it eats earthworms a lot as a major part of its diet uh, and what we see with the data um, the yellow spots here or the non-filled circles correspond to urban environments and they have higher lead concentrations in the blackbird feathers compared with the rural sites uh, the graph is actually a comparison of unwashed and washed feathers um, recognizing there's a contribution of just dust adhering to the feathers which might complicate things a little bit however um, that urban rural divide still exists whether we consider washed or unwashed feathers slightly higher concentrations as you'd expect in feathers with dust on them compared to feathers with without dust okay so it is a real food web transfer effect probably um, related to the concentrations of the earthworms in the urban sites compared with rural uh, we start to get a little bit more worried about it as a as the human species when food web transfers might end up with us um, and 
Turio Baldessari et al. did a, a study of uh, polychlorinated uh, organic compounds, the diphenyls, biphenyls and things, quite actually toxic in some cases known, carcinogens in different um, components of dairy cattle. Right. Um, yeah. But the photo is not from their study. Cows sniffing a car battery, um, which would obviously be a source of lead, not necessarily polychlorinated biphenyls, but that's another story. Um, but basically what we're seeing here is that there are significant concentrations of um, these contaminants in the bodies of uh, animals from different sites, uh, which in many cases exceed the uh, toxic equivalent concentrations. But I guess most importantly uh, for us, they are transferred to uh, the milk of the dairy cattle, and that means that they have the potential to enter human food chains. Okay, so, uh, and that one of the rows in the table shows the ratio of... Uh, actually, we'll just leave that. Different types of compounds, I'm not sure how useful that is. Okay, food web transfers, we know. Um, and th This is not so much a, a food web transfer as, as being a direct ingestion by humans of contaminated material. Um, so, lead and soils, in this study anyway, the authors thought it came from mainly industry emissions and automobile exhaust, which is certainly true um, in Australia as well and in older parts of Australian cities um, where we still have wooden houses is often the old house paint which is an either as a legacy present still in the soil or um, still exists on the buildings and that can cause quite significant issues as well. We know that also that young children especially eat soil, they'll quite happily sit in bare soil or a sand pit and chow down on soil and get their mouth all dirty. Um, it's just a naturally curious thing that kids do. Um, and uh, so a lot of the studies are done with kids that are about four or five years old um, because of that behaviour and because they're young and their blood lead levels therefore represent more recent exposure. And so the, the data on this slide show a couple of things. Um, first of all, the relationship between soil lead and bioaccessible lead. So basically lead that's extractable by a synthetic digestive fluid um, compared with total soil lead log scales and there's quite a, a significant and uh, compelling relationship between what's in the soil and what's potentially accessible to be absorbed by the human body once it gets into our digestive system. And if we take this uh, vertical axis on the top plot and put some of those values on the bottom plot. So bioaccessibility then becomes a predictor for the blood lead of children. Again, it's a significant relationship explaining about just over two thirds of the variability in blood lead. Uh, and even though that a few apparent observations, each one of these points would represent a mean of children that live in soil having this lead bioaccessibility. So um, quite strong chance or risk of lead toxicity to children um, from urban soils in that regard. And you can read the article and others. There, there's a lot of literature on this because of the risks um, for more information. Okay, and of course there are other urban processes or pathways that may result in uh, risk to humans or other organisms. For example, um, metals in water or other contaminants in water is, is very very common in urban systems as an example here. Uh, airborne dust, um, the study here is um, in the inner cities of Australia but this group has also done some work in Mount Isa uh, where there is dust from mining activities, mining of, of um, lead and copper uh, and also the increasing importance of vegetables grown in urban environments to feed growing populations carries with it a risk of food web transfers as well. Okay, so um, just recapping some of the stuff and, and looking at some studies, or in fact one study hardly at all, uh, that 
tried to assess the benefit of using organisms as bioindicators or bioassays. Um, so the point is that some biological parameters seem to respond. So we've got our control site on the left again uh, against some contaminated sites and the significant effect of soil contamination compared with control um, on in this case earthworm numbers, just the total number of earthworms, not their breeding success or anything as the biological indicator. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, and if we look at uh, plant species, and here are the contaminated sites here in the grey and crossed hatched bars, sometimes the effect is as we would expect. Um, so root length for uh, contaminated sites lower than some of the non-contaminated, although the effect here is not completely compelling because one of the non-contaminated sites also has a low root length for one species, so these are plant species along the bottom, they're full taxonomic names uh, here, but in some cases there's a quite counterintuitive effect. Um, for example, at this contaminated site for AV species, uh, significantly higher root length in a contaminated soil compared with the non-contaminated sites. Um, and the same is true for um, the lolium perenne, the perennial ryegrass. More subtle effects but still statistically significant. So sometimes things happen that we don't expect and of course the differences here may be due to soil properties and, and bioavailability uh, or the age of contamination and so on at each site. Um, or it could represent a stress response by the plants or something. We, we don't really know. Um, but if, if you look at, uh, from the same study, uh, a range of biological indicators, so uh, bait strips, earthworm numbers, um, some uh, and some other microbial or, or other endpoints and even when they're combined as a, a sum of scores there's not a consistent relationship between the contaminated sites, the ones which I've highlighted in yellow here, and the ranking of uh, sites according to these microbial or, or biological assays. So what we should expect really is all the yellow highlighted ones because they're in contaminated soils have the lower scores, they're at the bottom, but they don't. They don't. Certainly uh, the most contaminated site, the NCC, with, with sky-high concentrations of lead and zinc and copper and particularly arsenic there, um, has the lowest ranking, um, but the others don't quite match. Right. So, in summary, um, we've seen the overall learning objective illustrated by a number of case studies, but the case studies also illustrate the complications in that we have different responses for different species. Co-contamination complicates things further because we can't predict the effects just from the on the basis of each individual effect of contaminants um, and so on. Okay. If you want to follow any of this up, here is a list of references.